Edge. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We thank you because you are present here with us. And we thank you for all those who are here and in all the various locations where we're studying the word together. We pray, Lord, you help us to really examine your word, study your word, internalize the word, believe the word. And everything we hear will do good in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a good and better. Amen. God bless you. You can see that we come to the Bible study tonight. And I want to remind you how important the Bible study is. The Bible study is the backbone of the believer. And many of us have been students in schools. We pay attention. We read over what we learned and then we're able to put that thing on paper. Eventually, some of us even became teachers, teaching other people the word of God. If we paid attention at school, if we learned everything well at school, if we concentrated when we studied, we studied those uh, subjects at school, and then we're able to master them. The same thing we should do when we come to study the Word of God. And I think that if we really evaluate very well and compare very well the Word of life, the word of salvation, the word of his grace, the word of revelation given by the Lord is more important than all the subjects we studied at school. Number one, we need to encourage our children. The way we encourage our children to study and to concentrate on their studies at school, we should do more and make sure that our children actually study the word of God. You want them to get to heaven you want them to be saved and so more than we encourage them to study earthly subjects for their education we should encourage them to study the word of God for life eternal and then ourselves now as we were teenagers and we studied our books our, our, our for education in the same way our Teenagers should not be allowed running around playing pranks or whatever when the Bible study is going on. If you are a parent having teenage children and you realize that your teenage children are not concentrating on the Word of God more than they do at school. And if you leave it like that, I'll say you're a careless parent. And you're a parent not understanding the eternal future of your children. Encourage our children, encourage our youths, encourage our teenagers that they will regard the word of God, appreciate the word of God, exalt the word of God above the words of men that are studying many authors. And now ourselves too, the same concentration we gave to our earthly studies and what school, that same consideration and concentration and commitment we give to the word of God now. I sometimes ask myself, now I'm an adult, how did I study my chosen subject at school? I really did the study. And by the grace of God, now that I am nearer the end than at the beginning, I need to be very sure that what I believe is not fake. And I have to delve into the word of God just like I did in my educational days. And I give you the example. I'm always studying, I'm always reading, I'm always, always looking at the word of God so that I will know and confirm I have not followed cunningly uh, devised fables. Everybody in the church should do that. The people here at the headquarters and the people all over, everywhere. And when I was at school, there were teachers, I wasn't happy with because they didn't teach thoroughly as they ought to teach but I never missed class 
There were times I would be a little bit uh, unhealthy, maybe sick many years ago now, but I never allowed a slight headache a slight problem, a problem on the road to hinder me in studying what I wanted to study. And that's why, by the grace of God, I made it here in life. And I want to make it to heaven. I'm talking to somebody there. You will make it in Jesus' name. When I see those empty seats there, whatever the reason, if the economy is the, you know, whatever, I feel that the people who should study the word of God more than we did at school, they're not putting in the excitement and the devotion that they should put in in studying the word of God. The same thing in the state, in the region, in the nations, everywhere. Let us understand if we have decided to join and to be part of the deeper life Bible church, then we should give the highest esteem and the highest concentration to the word of God that was studying more than we did, you know, in our earlier days. Can I remind you, I never, never in my school days, either secondary or primary or university, I, never, I don't remember me ever getting up to go somewhere and come back while the teacher was teaching. And it is unthinkable that as the word of God is going on and we're teaching the word of God, somebody will get up, go and then come in it's not right. I should never do that. Always think about Christ passing his word to you through the preacher. And even though he's not physically here, he's spiritually here. And if Christ the Lord, Christ the Savior, and Christ the teacher is teaching you, and you leave him talking, you're not interested in what next thing he will say what next point it will give and then you get up and roam about and do whatever you want to do outside and then come in i cannot imagine the new testament disciples ever doing that and so let's understand and give the glory due unto the lord give him that glory as we do that motivate mobilize our children our youths make them behave right at the bible study and we ourselves at their parents adults we also do the right thing as we come to the fellowship to the study and to learn from the lord i pray the blessings of the lord and the blessing of studying will multiply in every life in jesus name amen the final thing before I go to the study, our leaders, our leaders who are, you know, helping to bring our members understand the purpose why we're divided into districts, into groups, into local churches, so that we'll have a shepherd, a leader that the people will respect and they will be effective in bringing the people to the central church. Otherwise, why do we have the leaders there? If we're not doing that, if you only come by yourself, you don't check up who is there, who is not there, we have failed in fulfilling the purpose of our calling and the purpose why the Lord put us there and so let's shake up let's shape up and let us be revived enough as we see the day approaching so that we will not be failures in Jesus name I will not be a failure if you don't do what the Lord has raised up to you to do you are a failure and I don't know what to expect in as reward from the Lord on the final day. Let's all work together. Let's unite together. I do my duty. I do my part. Do your part. Do your duty so that 
the church, the people of God under you will stand up to what they ought to stand up for and do what they ought to do. Don't pet the people, don't pat the people on the back. Show them the way. And as you go on the way yourself and you call other people, they'll follow the way as well in Jesus' name. Today we're coming to Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 41. In Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 41, and whereas thou sawest the feet and the and the toes patch of potter's clay and patch of iron the kingdom shall be divided but there shall be in all in as there shall be in age the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with merry clay, verse 42, in verse 42, and as the toes of the feet were patch of iron and patch of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Verse 43, in verse 43, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with the merry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the siege of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Then verse 44, in verse 44 it tells us, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be led to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45, in verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron the brass the clay the silver and the and the gold the great god has made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof shown. You remember we're looking at the dream that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar. It was a great revelation, a great revelation of things that will happen in the latter days, the things that will happen hereafter. And then he couldn't find an interpreter. In fact, he had forgotten the dream. And he threatened that all the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the wise men of Babylon that were not able to recover the dream. He was going to get rid of them. And as the threat was about to be fulfilled, then the executioners got to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, Daniel said, why the hurry? What's happening here? And the uh, person, the executioner, explained to him, and then he said, let me see the king myself. And then he got to Nebuchadnezzar and said, give me time. I will reveal the dream unto you. Please remember that uh, Daniel was a real believer, a true believer. Not only that, not only that was saved and sanctified, he was a serving believer. And he had the gifts and the skill that will make his service acceptable before men and also rewardable by God. He had the gift of the word of knowledge. He had the gift of the word of wisdom. He had the gift of faith. You can tell as he went to the lions, then that man had the gift of the working of miracles too. And eventually as he went to the Lord and he prayed that same night, not another week and not another month, because God had said, while you are praying, I will answer. While you are still speaking, I will hear you. So the Lord fulfilled that promise in his life that the Lord should 
him the dream that Nebuchadnezzar dreamt and that he had forgotten and also gave him the interpretation and he came now to the king and he related the dream and the dream is about the earthly kingdoms that will be replaced by the heavenly kingdom the topic tonight is earthly kingdoms soon to be displaced by Emmanuel's kingdom. Three things we're looking at in the message tonight. Number one, the divided kingdom weakened by mixture with claim. The divided kingdom weakened by mixture with claim. Number two, the divine kingdom wielded by majesty for continuity uh, the kingdom that will come and replace and displace all those other kingdoms and it will continue in majesty forever and ever number three uh, the decreed king worthy of mastery over all crowns over all the people that wear any crown in every generation in every age the decreed king the final king the heavenly king and the appointed king by the almighty is coming and he is worthy of mastery over all the kingdoms of the world in all generations of the earth. We're coming to number one. Number one is the divided kingdom weakened by mixture with claim. And we're looking at this under three perspectives. And we're looking at number one, the weakness of mixed iron clay kingdom communities. Number two, the willfulness of mingled Christian canal kingdom citizens. Number three is the worldliness of mixed multitudes as kingdom kingdom corruptors. Number one. Number one is the weakness of mixed iron clay, clay iron kingdom communities. We've read about that as uh, Daniel interpreted the dream. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, did you see uh, the various uh, kingdoms? Number one is of gold, that's Babylon. Number two is the chest and the arms, the Middle Persian government. And number three is uh, the one that will follow the Grecian kingdom. Now the, the last one, which is the fourth one, you find that their feet of iron and the toes, ten toes, are mixed with clay. And that's the one he's talking about now, the weakness of such a government and the weakness of such a system with iron on the one hand and clay on the other hand and they are mixed together. We're looking at Hosea chapter 7 and I'm reading from verse Age. Hosea chapter 7, reading from verse 8, Ephraim, he has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. It's not only the kingdom of Babylon, even Israel. Israel referred to here as Ephraim. Ephraim as a tribe. Ephraim as a nation, Ephraim as the selected chosen people of God, they did not keep their integrity. They did not keep their death and commitment of the call of God upon their lives. They mixed with others. They mix with the people of flesh and the people that are feeble and the people that do not fully know God. And it says Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake, not turned. And then in verse, in verse 9, it says, Strangers have devoured his strength. As a church, as you think of us, as a church, as a domain, as an entity called by the Lord and given the word and were to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. It's good to go and evangelize. We're bringing them in. It's good to go and do evangelism. We're fulfilling the great commission, but it's not good to mix with the world. It's not good to begin to evaluate our consecration, our devotion, 
a commitment, a conviction with the people of the world and then to accommodate them and to accommodate the people we're trying to evangelize we kind of uh, slow down and we cool down and we bring in their own misunderstanding of scripture and their own commitment to the Lord and we so mix with them so that they will know we are one we're not one Ephraim and the other nations, they were not one. Ephraim should be one within themselves, but not one with the people of idolatrous nation. The same thing, the people of God saved and sanctified and soul winning and going out to reach other people, we should be one within ourselves, but not one with the people who are not saved and the people who are not born again and the people that do not know the depth of the mystery of the kingdom of God but Ephraim had been devout by, uh, by the uh, strength of other people, he knows each not. Strangers have devout his strength, and he knows he ignores as a believer yourself. When you are too much in interaction and intimacy and discussion and sharing with the people of no faith, and the people of no commitment and the people who are not faithful you become compromised yourself and you lose your strength and you will not know you'll say say i'm saved i'm sanctified i'm baptized in the holy ghost but your strength is gone like Ephraim. Strangers are devout in strength. And he knows it not. Ye gray ears are here and there upon him. Yet he knows it not. Uh, you know, as I've read that, I wondered. It says gray ears are here and there upon him. I look at myself. I say, but I know. I know great ears are there. How do I know? I look at the mirror. I look at the mirror. Every time I check up, every morning I check up, I look at the mirror and I can tell that the gray ears are there. Ephraim was not looking at the mirror. The mirror of the watch of God that will show the gray areas of our life. He was not looking at the mirror, and because of that, gray areas are here and there, compromises are here and there, lowering the standard, it's here and there, and the amalgamation of the world here and there. But Ephraim did not know he was not looking at the mirror. When we look at the mirror of the word of God, we'll see the compromises that are coming in. We'll see the lowering of standard coming in. And we'll see the strangers devouring our strength. And we we'll think about it. And James said, we should not just look at the mirror and leave it like that and go our way. We will do something about what we see from the mirror we're looking at Hosea chapter 13 and I'm reading from verse 9 Hosea chapter 13 verse 9 O Israel thou hast destroyed thyself by all those uh, kind of interactions with the people of the world and with other nations thou hast destroyed thyself because of the mingling together of iron and clay you have destroyed yourself but there is a chance now and but in me is thy help we can come back to the Lord and the Lord will renew our strength in Jesus name let me hear a good amen you remember Samson Samson was a man of strength a man of power a man of sight and a man the Lord had raised up to conquer the enemies on behalf of the nation Israel but again he mixed himself with the people in the other nations until Delilah came intimacy came in discussion came in and the telling stories 
this all that came in and the Samson felt at ease in the presence of Delilah and how they could talk and talk obviously he wasn't listening to the prophets anymore he wasn't listening to the proclaimers of the word anymore he wasn't even evaluating what he had known what he had had before he was now totally engaged with the strange woman and eventually he lost his sight he lost his strength he lost the spirit of god walking with him he lost everything that had made him a man of prophecy we should be careful in our lives that as the final kingdom that um, nebuchadnezzar saw in the dream was a mixture of iron and clay we should be careful that we don't mix with the world that will lose our strength, our spirituality, our conviction, our devotion unto the Lord. Look at number two here. Number two is the willfulness of mingled Christian canal kingdom citizens, the people that have known the Lord and the people that have given their hearts to the Lord. They become kingdom citizens and they're no more canal, they're new creatures in Christ. But now the danger comes when the Christian and the canal, when they mix together, when they talk together, when the Christian sees eye to eye with the carnal, when they consecrated, when he sees eye to eye with the compromising church goer, then we have a terrible problem. We're looking at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 43. Daniel chapter 2 verse 43, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with mercury clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And we're looking at uh, Psalm 106, and I'm reading from verse 35. Psalm 106, verse 35, but they were mingled among the heathen, and they learned their works. They were mingled among the heathen. He's talking about the holy people of God, the righteous people of God, the redeemed and ransomed people of God. He's talking about the people that have a part in the kingdom. And the Lord had said, I'll make them a kingdom of priests, a kingdom, a royal kingdom. The people that had been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But now they mingled among the heathen. And as they mingled among the heathen, the heathen, they'll bring out some ideas. And they'll say, this is what we've been doing. And they'll say, uh-uh, don't bring deeper life here. Don't bring a Bible here. Don't bring holiness here now. If that's all you have, all you have is holiness. All you have is sanctification. All you have is the purity of heart. And then you come into an assembly. You come into association with, you know, the religious association. And they say, please understand, don't bring holiness here. Don't bring deep life here. Don't bring righteousness here. Well, you know you don't fit into that community. If you fit into that community, and they're not calling you a good brother, a good sister, and they say he understands us, that we don't want to have holiness, he understands us, she understands us. We don't want to have sanctification, he understands us, she understands us. She lives or he lives the deeper life, sanctification, holiness over there, but when he comes over here, it's now it's trying his best to be like us is doing its best to understand us and to do exactly what we do you are lost because without holiness no man shall see the Lord 
whatever you gain by mingling with them, you have lost the most important thing in your life. That's what happened to the children of Israel. They so mingled with the key there that they learned their works. Learned their works. It doesn't mean that they went to any school there, but they learned by observation. If I do this, the people react, so they learn, so that the heathen will not react against them. If I do this, come, come, come. You are bringing holiness. You are bringing it for life. And by the criticism, by the opposition, by the reaction, they learn. They shouldn't go that direction. You have learned of Christ and you took the yoke of Christ upon you. And now when you are learning from the heathen and you are adjusting to the heathen, everything you learned from Christ, you are dropping. And eventually, if you drop one percentage today and you drop one percentage next week and you drop one percentage the other week, it only takes about 100 weeks, you drop 100 percent drop a little at a time a little at a time don't change too much don't change a little so that your uh, communication your interaction and your fellowship with the people with the heathen with the people that do not have any standard so that your amalgamation with them will stay and will stick when you lose one percent a week, one percent another week, you will soon lose everything. And it doesn't take too long, a hundred weeks, less than two years, you'll be like them. Because you are losing a little at a time. That's the danger that people have. The people who mix and the people who listen to those other people and they say, well, this is what they want. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to, you know, rob them the wrong direction. Anytime I say that, they react. Every time I do that, they react. I think I have conviction, and I think I have my reason for doing that, and I'm trying to help everybody so that everybody will get to heaven. That's why I do what I do, but there's reaction. Okay, because of that reaction, a change only one percent only one percent you'll soon be zero no conviction you'll soon be a zero you'll not have any advance any forward movement that's what happened to them those children of israel it says they were mingled among the heathen and they learned their works look at verse 39 in verse 39 it says those were they defiled with their own works and they went a warring with their own inventions verse 40 in verse 40 it says therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people. The judgment that would have come upon the Gentiles alone also came upon them. And the destruction and devastation, desolation that should have come upon the heathen alone also came upon them. It says the Lord was the Lord's wrath was kindled against them in so much that he abhorred his own inheritance. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with the unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, or what communion has light or darkness. Verse 15, in verse 15, and what concord has Christ with Belial, and what part as he that believeth with infidels. Verse 16, verse 16 says, uh, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be 
be my people. Verse 17, verse 17 says, Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate. That's what God said. And be ye separate. And we still separate as a church in our practice, in our conviction, in our consecration. I will still separate from the people of the world. I will still separate from the people that protest whenever there is something they don't agree with, right or wrong. Whether the people who have done that thing, they realize sin. And they want to see how to mellow down. They want to see how to correct what they have done wrong. Yet the people outside protest will begin. And they protest in different ways, physical. They protest in various ways, violence. And they protest in various ways, psychological. And now it says we shall come out from among them that we do not riot. We do not protest and we do not uh, fight. We do not bring in violence, whether psychological, systematic, uh, scheming, uh, protest. We do not have that if we're children of God. It says, come out from among them. In our families, between husband and wife, no protest, indirect protest silent quiet protest and with parents and children the children do not protest in a you know in a, a childish way yes but the parents will get they'll get the information and they will get the alert that the children are protesting either they will not eat or they will, you know, do whatever. They know how they do that. If we're Christian, a Christian child, a Christian teenager, a Christian, a believer, whether man or woman, we do not act and protest like the people of the world. And in the church as well, not only with, uh, you know, children and the parents and husband and wife, in our schools, whatever is happening, we don't join the other people protesting because that makes you like the world. And when you come to the church, you know, we see this, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. And then during question and answer period on Sunday, we raise up our hands and the leader who is going to call us to a kind of have the question, he doesn't know what we are bringing out of the pocket. And then we're trying to find a way that, uh, you know, the, what we're asking, uh, we quote a verse, and, not, and you know you are protesting. We have lost our Christian experiences. It says that when we're children of God, there is no protest or other people that the body language and the action there, action there, that shows that we are like the people of the world, come out from among them and be ye separate says the Lord and then he says and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you then verse 18 in verse 18 and I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty and the church said Amen. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the worldliness of mixed multitudes as kingdom corruptors. As kingdom corruptors. Here is the kingdom of God. Here is the church of, of the living God. And then we're coming. You're coming in to make the kingdom better. Make the church better. And uh, when you come in, you look at what had been done. Uh, the consecration of the people before you came. The commitment of the people before you came. The submission of the people before you came. And now you come in. How can I make things better? How can I lift up? the standard. How can I maintain the standard I made? Earnestly contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. But you know, the people that mingle themselves like the iron and the clay, they do not make things better. They make the kingdom weaker. They make the kingdom 
was. That's why we're told, look at Numbers chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 1. In Numbers chapter 11, reading from verse 1, and when the people, and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. Complaining, murmuring, grumbling, conspiring, displeases the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it tells us, and the meek's multitude that was among them fell and lost him. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? That kind of attitude to criticism of leadership and complaining against what God has said, it displeases the Lord, and then the wrath of the Lord comes upon the people. And some people become so emotional, and they were even weeping, and they were saying, who shall give us flesh to eat? It displeases the Lord. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 6, reading from verse 28. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 28. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. Now, the prophet was not praising them. He was not appreciating them because they were adamant, because they were strong, because they revolted, and because they said, we tear everything down. If it doesn't go away, the Lord was not commending them. He said, they're all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are all corruptors. It tells us in Bastachi, in Bastachi it says, Reprobate silver shall men call them reprobate, backsliding, rotting, shall men call them because the Lord has rejected them. In James chapter 4, verse 4, James chapter 4, reading from verse 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It's not the French of the saints, it's the French of the backsliders, it's the French of the sinners, it's the French of the worldly, and then it brings what he has got from his friends outside the kingdom. It brings that to the kingdom of God, and he, he said he is an enemy of God. It tells us in First John chapter two verse fifteen. First John chapter two verse fifteen. Love not the world, neither the things which are in the world. If any man if any man, he was saved before, but now if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Whatever we do, whatever we say, however we preach, we ask ourselves, am I doing that because of the love of God that fills my heart? The love, the love for righteousness, for holiness that fills my heart? Or am I doing it because I love the sinful world? I love the sinners in the world. I love the compromisers of the world. I love the backsliders in the world. And so I'm going to do this to show my love for the transgressors in the world. It says, if any man love the world you love the world so much you can trample on the church you love the world so much you can tear apart the doctrine the lord has given us you love the world so much you must show by your negative action to the people of god it says if any man 
any woman of course if anyone love the world the love of the father is not in him look at verse 16 in verse 16 it tells us for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but of the world then in verse 17 it says in verse 17 and the world passeth away and the lost thereof but he that doeth doeth constantly doeth as a priority doeth when it's convenient or not convenient doeth when it's a painful and when it's pleasurable he that Doeth the will of God and he does the will of God promptly, he does the will of God wholeheartedly, he does the will of God voluntarily. Nobody pushing him and nobody imposing anything on her. He loves the will of God, she loves the will of God, and he, anyone, and she, anyone that does that will of God because it's saved, because it's really born again, because it's sanctified, and the old Adamic nature had been dealt with. And because of that, it's nature now, it's liking now, it's pleasure now, it's desire now, is to do the will of God in heaven. That's the one that will abide forever. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, we're looking at the divine kingdom wielded by majesty for continuity. We're looking at Daniel chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 44. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the king shall the god of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be led to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand for how long tell me out aloud it shall stand forever. That, 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 that's the kingdom, the divine kingdom uh, that is wielded by the majesty of the Lord and it is for continuity. Three things we're looking at. Look at number one, uh, the immutability of Emmanuel's kingdom. Number two is the indestructibility of his everlasting uh, kingdom. Number three is the incorruptibility of his established kingdom. Number one, we're looking at the immutability of Emmanuel's kingdom. We've read that in Daniel already. And look at uh, Matthew chapter 1, reading from verse 21. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it tells us, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Always remember that. You claim you are saved, you are saved from sin. Always remember that. You claim you are saved, you are saved from corruption. Always remember that. You claim you are saved, you are saved from the dirty, corrupted society. And you are brought out of sin. You are brought into the kingdom of God. Verse 22. In verse 22, it says, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, verse 23, saying what? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and be a child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us, the king that will establish an imperishable government, imperishable kingdom, his name is Emmanuel. Look at Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. In Daniel 
chapter 7, verse 13, I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came of the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him the Son near before him the father the ancient of this in verse 14 in verse 14 and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed that's Emmanuel's kingdom it continues forever it's immutable it's unchangeable look at number two there number two there we're looking at the indestructibility of his everlasting kingdom we're looking at daniel chapter 2 reading from verse 35 daniel chapter 2 reading from verse 35 then was the iron the clay the brass the silver and the gold broke in to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth look at verse 44 in verse 44 here we're told and in the days of these kings that is of babylon of middle persia of greece and of, of rome it says in the days of these empires and these kingdoms and these kings the god of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, indestructible, which shall never be destroyed, nor be left, and shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And I pray you'll be in that kingdom that will stand forever in Jesus' name. Daniel chapter 6, reading from verse 26. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 26, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel for he is the living God. You see that? And he's steadfast forever, steadfast forever, steadfast forever, steadfast forever. If we are children of that same God, we'll be steadfast as long as we live. He called us into the kingdom, and the kingdom, the evangelical kingdom. He calls us to the kingdom, the established kingdom. He calls us into the kingdom, the everlasting kingdom. And he is a steadfast God and he is steadfast forever. If we are children of God and we have the grace of God and we have the nature of God in us, we will be steadfast as well following after him. We come into the kingdom, an established kingdom. We will be established in the virtues of the kingdom we come into the kingdom the everlasting kingdom where we will be established in the everlasting virtue of the Lord who has brought us into the everlasting kingdom it says he steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even Unto the end. Its dominion shall be unto the end. What's dominion? When you have a territory and you have people there, citizens there, subjects there, and those people are submissive to the one who is having the dominion and the kingdom. That's dominion. And when we come into the kingdom of God, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of 
God, except a man be born of the water of the word and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom, the kingdom of God. If we have entered into the kingdom, then the Father has dominion over us. And we submit and we're subjected to his rule. We never do anything. I feel like, uh-uh, we don't do as we feel. I think that we don't do as we think. We look at the one that has dominion in his kingdom. My brother, my sister, you're born again. You're in the kingdom. This is his kingdom. And we don't come into the kingdom to just do whatever you like, whatever we feel, whatever we think. And we're under his dominion unto the end. That's the virtue and that's the nature of his kingdom. And it says his dominion shall be even unto the end. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 9 reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it. There's no disorderliness in the kingdom of God. There's no violent rioting in the kingdom of God. And there's no tearing apart in the kingdom of God. He orders everything in his kingdom and then it says and to establish it with justice judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever from henceforth even forever from the time we enter into the kingdom we meet the kingdom of the scripture and the, and the kingdom that has a standard and from that point on and forever we we'll keep under the rule and the reign of the king of the kingdom. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Now it tells us the actual world to have. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 14 and verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, follow peace with all men. That's for those who are in the kingdom, in the kingdom of peace, in the kingdom of the prince of peace. And so if there's anything coming up in any heart that will uh, destroy the peace of the kingdom, that's not right. That's not of God. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then in verse 28, verse 28 then tells us, wherefore, we receiving a kingdom, the kingdom of peace. Therefore, we receiving a kingdom, a kingdom with the dominion that is forever and ever. We receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God peaceably, acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the incorruptibility of his established kingdom. Incorruptibility of his established kingdom. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, for this you know, that no monger that's an adulterer. That's a fleshly man. He feels the woman. He says, for ye you know that no monger, none of them belonging anywhere, coming anywhere, in any church, in any fellowship, that no monger, no unclean person, unclean in thought, unclean in action, unclean in disposition, unclean in what they touch and what they see and what they feel and the things they put to practice it says no unclean person no covetous man who is an idolater a covetous man is an idolater if he covets money he makes money the idol he lifts up money he exalts money above God money becomes an idol if he gives it to a man or to a woman 
above God. That man, that woman becomes the idol. If he gives in to the things that be in the world and the sin occupies his heart and he thinks of that above thinking about God, that thing becomes an idol. And it says, a covetous man, I want, I desire, I grab, I must have, Delilah can become an idol. That you forget the vows you have. You forget the consecration you have. You forget the prophecy that had gone on before you were even conceived and born. And you forget every good thing and the purpose why God has raised you up. And you are now in intimate and consumed with your interaction with Delilah. Delilah becomes the idol. Anything, anyone will lift up above God becomes an idol to us. And it says, you know, that no covetous man who is an idolater shall have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words because of these, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. I pray we remain in the kingdom and nothing will become an idol in our lives in Jesus name. Amen. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at the decreed king worthy of mastery over all crowns. The one that God the Father the king of heaven that he has decreed that this is the king, the king that will rule and reign forever and ever. This is that king worthy of mastery over all crowns. Uh, we're looking at Daniel chapter 2 verse 45. In Daniel chapter 2 verse 45, for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king, to Nebuchadnezzar, what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure we're looking at some two reading from verse six some two we're reading from verse six it says in some two verse six yet have i set my king upon my holy hill of zion look at verse seven in verse seven i will declare the decree the lord has said unto me thou art my son this day have I begotten thee. Then in verse 8, it says in verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. This is the king, and this is the Lord. This is the Savior that is going to have the heathen. The gentle world, and from many nations of the world, is going to have people in his kingdom. Saved sanctified serving the lord with all their heart all their soul and all their mind and he says i shall give those even to you for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession that's what encourages us to evangelize that's what encourages us to reach and to touch the uttermost part of the earth every village every town every city every community and every nation because the promise has been there the prophecy has been given that the almighty god will give the uttermost part of the earth for the possession of the king he has decreed and ordained look at verse 9 in verse 9 it says thou shalt break them with a rod of iron thou shalt dash 
them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Look at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the supernatural power behind the smiting stone. Number two, we're looking at the sovereign power bestowed on the sinless son. And number three, the saving, sanctifying power of the all-sufficient sovereign. We're looking at number one. Number one is the supernatural power behind the smiting stone. In Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 34, Daniel chapter 2, verse 34, thou sawest till that a stone was caught out without hands. Not natural. A stone was caught out without hands, without human agency, without human help, and without human hand. That's Christ, born of a virgin, not according to the natural agency. And then he lived a life supernatural, not according to the human strength, and according to what obtains normally in society. And all these miracles, not because of human education or human upliftment. There was nothing connected with the human hand without, uh, without hand, that is, the hand that came out without any human help. And his death, his death, as he died, they said yes, while the others, they crucified, had not died, and he was buried, and he rose again without human agency. And he was with the disciples 40 days with many valuable proofs, and then on, at the end of the 40 days, he was taken up to heaven without any human help. That's the one he is sovereign. He has the power. And he said, Thou sawest until his stone was caught out without hands, and which smote the image upon his feet, and that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, it says, Then was the iron the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke in to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the, the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth and filled the whole earth. Wherever the sun shines, that's the earth, and filled the whole earth. Wherever there is any human being, anyone living, that's the whole earth. And Christ, the name, the power, the reign, the dominion filled the whole earth. That is the supernatural power manifested behind that smiting stone. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Revelation chapter 11, we're reading from verse 15. Here it tells us that the kingdom of the world, it says that the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, kingdoms in the plural, kingdoms in the east and in the west and the north and the south, kingdoms in every continent of the world, every nation of the world, and the kingdoms of this world, the long-standing kingdoms and the kingdom that just came, and the ten toes of the final demonstration of the Roman Empire, all the kingdoms of the world, it says they become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I will be there. I said I will be there 
by salvation, that's how we get there. By sanctification, that's how we reach there. By holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Every moment and every night, everywhere, whether people are with us, they are not with us. And we follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's how we're going to be there. And he says all the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. We're coming to number two here. Number two here is the sovereign power bestowed on the sinless son. The sinless son. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 9, reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Then in verse 7, it tells us in verse 7, and of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there shall be no end. The kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of that sinless son, the kingdom of the supernatural sovereign son of God. It says of that kingdom, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Amen. The power of Satan cannot stop, retard, hinder, slow down, destroy the zeal of the Lord. The power of any man, the policy of any man, and the policy of human beings here on earth cannot prevail against the zeal of the Lord. Christ will be king. The Son of God will be king. That spotless, sinless Son of God, he will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. We're coming to number three here. Number three is the saving, sanctifying power of the all-sufficient sovereign. He has the power. He has the authority. He has the majesty. He has the all-sufficiency of his sovereignty, of his strength, of heaven's virtue, of heaven's possibilities, so that his power will work this in every man. And it says... He's saving. He has the saving power. He's sanctifying. He has the sanctifying power. And he has the sufficient power. All sufficient so that he will establish his kingdom and will establish his own people in his kingdom. Look at Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 11. Acts chapter 4, verse 11. This is the story. That stone cut out without hands and smote that smote that image, and all the image was broken in pieces, and it became like chaff and driven away by the wind of God's judgment. He said, That stone, this is the stone which was set at naught of your builders, which is become the head of the corner. It's become the chief cornerstone. It's become the mighty powerful stone. It's become the indestructible and it's become the indisputable stone that shattered everything in pieces. Look at verse 12. In verse 12 it says, Neither is there salvation in any other. Neither is there salvation in any other king, in any other chief. In any other ruler, anywhere, in any other religion, anywhere, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby 
we must be saved. He, is the, he has the saving power and it's so sufficient and it can keep us saved. It can keep us righteous. It can keep us holy as citizens and saints in his kingdom until the very end. It tells us in Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21, and I'm reading there from verse 42. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 42, Jesus says unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which was uh, which the builders rejected the same is become the hedge of the corner this is the lord's doing all this prophecy about the stone all this prediction about the stone all these that will be performed about the stone the Lord's doing is what the Lord had emphasized and predicted and prophesied and proclaimed. He said, This is the Lord's doing. And then it says, It is marvelous in our eyes. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, it says, And whomsoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Those who voluntarily come to the Lord have heard, have seen, and I see that if I continue in this way, there's punishment, there's perdition, there is evil, there is regret, eternal regret, and you fall on that stone. Then your heart is broken and all those things are broken away from your life, and now you live free because the yoke is broken, and the evil things of the past, they are broken but the so wage and they will not pray and they will not be convicted they will not fall down at the feet of this mighty king of kings and lord of lords it says but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder. The people that wait to the last time and they do not voluntarily come to the Lord and they do not voluntarily turn unto the Lord, they shall be broken. Not only that, they will be kind of ground into powder. I pray you'll not wait until that final time. We're looking at First Peter chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 6. First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. The people that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that sinless son of Christ, and that son of, of God, and that uh, sovereign one, as we believe on him, then we will not be condemned, and will not be confounded, and we will not enter into eternal condemnation. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says unto you, therefore, for which believe he is precious, but unto them which are, which be disobedient, they have for repentance, they're disobedient, they hear of being restored totally unto Christ, they're disobedient, and they hear of correcting their ways, and they hear of showing honor and respect unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the care of exalting the word of the Lord that was studied above our subjects at school. And they keep on obeying their teachers at school, but the one that shows them and reveals to them the way of life into heaven, they are disobedient unto that. It says to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders is allowed the same is made the hedge of the corner then it says in verse 8 in verse 8 and a stone is stumbling is stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient we have come to the bible study today and we've had a lot what is your reaction and what is your response to what we have heard? Are we adamant? Are we disobedient? 
Are we defiant? Are we saying, I'm going to go my way? I don't want any king, Lord of Lord, King of Kings. I don't, I don't even want to hear of his commandment. I will still go my way. There's perdition, there's punishment, there's damnation for the people that will not surrender unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They're disobedient whereunto also they were appointed but look at verse 9 the people who hear of the king the people who hear of the son the spotless son the sinless son the people who hear of the one who died for us on the cross of calvary the people who hear of the one that spilled and gave this blood for our redemption and they submit unto them this those are the people now it says but ye a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye shall show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. His colors into the light and will shine with the light of the gospel in Jesus' name. He now tells us what our attitude ought to be in Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, he has, he has sanctifying power. He saved us, he has power to save. He sanctifies those who are saved, he has power to sanctify Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Then in verse 13, in verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. They might reproach you for being holy for being righteous, for being separated unto the Lord, for keeping to the scriptures. They might reproach you, criticize you, condemn you, conspire against you because you are standing for that holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. It says, look away from them. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Then in verse 14, in verse 14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We're seeking that eternal kingdom, and that eternal kingdom is coming. I will be there. You will be there in Jesus' name. Let's go to the Lord now and say, Lord, I've heard about your kingdom. I've heard about the kingdoms of this world and whatever their splendor, whatever their riches and whatever their glory, they will perish. But this is the everlasting kingdom you're calling me into. Lord, I surrender. I submit. I give myself unto you. Don't think about any other thing. Now think about the kingdom so that you will enter that kingdom. The grace of God is there. The might of the Lord is that the love of God is there. It's calling you come in and abide and stay in the kingdom forever, forever as he reigns, you will reign with him coming to the kingdom.